The September 2024 Observer's Calendar on episode 446 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky. And this podcast is for everyone who enjoys going out under the stars. Did you catch that one, Shane? I sure did. Because <laughs> I'm actually working on the 2025 and in our notes I put 2025, but uh, changed it back to 2024. So it's been a pretty busy time uh, for me working on and finishing up the RSC Observer's Calendar. I am really hoping to get it done uh, this week. Boy, howdy, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be nice to have that uh, completed and then a little bit of rest before you start the cycle again. <laughs> Yeah, rest by teaching an astronomy class for four weeks, and then I'll start the next calendar. Yeah, should cool. be good. Did you get any observing in this week? Uh, I think you were away, actually. But yeah, I was in Montreal for the week. Uh, beautiful yeah. city. Uh, I observed great food uh, and uh, great architecture and, and amazing culture. That was as far as my observing went. Yeah, cool. That's about great. You? Had a good time, and uh, me. I observed smoke and late night thunderstorms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. Um, the weather's been a little active. Yeah. Yeah. The smoke wasn't crazy. We had one, it came in on Friday morning, super bad, but it didn't last very long. It was like four or five hours of like the worst smoke that we've ever seen ever. But uh, it kind of cleared out you know, by the early afternoon. It was fine, but it was really bad. For a very short period of time, it was, it was relatively smoke-free. Smoke started rolling in around 10, and by 3 a.m., it was just like crazy thick smoke mixed with fog and woke up, could hardly see across my street. But by uh, I threw a mask on. I wore a mask for a couple hours, and uh, yeah, by the middle of the morning, it had dissipated enough. Even inside, like it was smoky inside even, and uh, yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't too long-lasting uh Fortunately, been making some progress on the observatory. I think I sent you some photos on mm -hmm. that. So that's exciting. And you were able to test it with a telescope for the vibration? Or... No, no, oh, okay. no. Um, we like, cause we just put the mount back in mm -hmm. yesterday. So it's been out for almost two months now. So took it out and then it's, it was planning to get the work done and what the work would be. And my builder had to, fit it in amongst all his other work and then i was away um and so then he waited till i came back to do it which is which is fine and i came out here when i was sick and he started it when i was sick and then we finished it uh yesterday so uh, what we did is that so it this is unconventional this observatory um and typically observatory piers are made out of either steel or cement, or a pretty good combination of both. Um, and typically, cement seems to, in general, be the way that people uh, like to like to do it. Um, however, there there's this problem with doing it all in cement here, which is that um, the ground is fairly unstable, eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, our concern was that if we made it out of cement. We we're putting a lot of weight into the side of the hill. And I was concerned about that. And my next door neighbor, who is an engineer, um, was also, I think he also expressed a little bit of concern with putting that much cement in there. So uh, I was already concerned. And then when we dug down, we hit a boulder. So I thought, well, yeah. What we end up using was a six by six piece of uh, hand selected pressure treated lumber, like the very best six by six my builder could find. And that is slightly unconventional because people typically don't use uh, wood for piers, or if they do, they usually end up taking uh, four of these and putting them together. But we just used one because, again, next door, they have a variety of these that are already in the hillside and down a certain way. And so we did it that way. Um, and it had some vibration. It was actually totally fine with the four inch, which is in a way what it was designed to carry. And it was, it was okay with the five, um, but I didn't want to put the seven on it. Cause mm -hmm. I got I, between when that pier was put in and, and when I started actually testing it, as, as you know, I 
end up buying a seven inch refractor. So what he ended up doing was getting, um, and I chatted with Eric Clausius about this as well over in Calgary, because he has some significant construction experience as well as astronomy experience. Mm -hmm. And he recommended getting angle iron and just putting some angle iron around it, which is what we end up doing slightly different than what Eric suggested, but pretty close. And we put in, uh, I think they're like one or one or two by two angle iron. Anyway, it's 50 pounds of angle iron, 40 or 50 pounds of angle iron surrounding the, um, the wood. And then uh, bolted that, uh, had to excavate, the builder had to go and excavate around the pier to get this in. And it and it dampened it probably 25 or 30%. And then he put in another 150 or 200 odd pounds of cement. And then once that dried and mostly cured, like it's uh, it's pretty damn solid now. There There's no vibration per se. If you... If you put your hand on one side of the pier and you really whack it, you can kind of feel like the shock transfer, but there's no, there's no resonance. Like there's no vibration at, at all. Um, so it's, it's really a combination of cement, steel and wool and wood at this point. So, uh, it's kind of canceling anything out. And, uh, and, uh, we, even before he, uh, put the steel on, I went and uh, gave it like three or four coats of, um, primer and paint and all this stuff so this thing should should last forever and we did the same thing with the steel as well um, i think we end up putting like six or eight coats of paint on it because technically speaking you aren't really supposed to contact uh, pressure treated wood with steel like that because it can it can react though they say now it's not as reactive hmm. uh, but regardless we put so many barriers between it that uh there's there's essentially no uh no steel in, in direct contact with the pressure treated wood or there there theoretically could be i suppose but uh, it's uh not enough that it would cause any kind of corrosion or anything like that so fingers crossed that should i think that should do the trick and this thing should probably last an eternity i would imagine hmm. Well, that's good. <clears throat> Excited to see it in operation. Yeah. And we, we, uh, so yesterday what we did is we, uh, we had the mount off of course, while that work was being done, he thought it would actually be fine to do the work because he's so careful that it probably would have been fine to leave the mount on there. It just, um, we end up taking it off just because I wanted it off, but he was totally fine to do the work with it on. Um, and he is so careful that I'm sure it would have been fine, but part of me kind of wanted it to be unweighted when he did the work. Um, so I, I don't know, probably six and one half a dozen to the other probably really didn't matter in the end. So anyway, what we did yesterday is we stuck the amount back on because the mount itself weighs uh, 30 odd pounds. I think 30, 27 pounds the way I had it set up when we, we put it back on. And then I had ordered the ADM saddles. And uh, so we put those uh, dual saddle plates on. And so now it's uh, it's ready to take a telescope. But there's no power up there currently. Uh, we, we had temporary power run to it for testing purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's maybe the thing that might be a little bit confusing for people hearing about this is we, he, he not we, I did like 5% of the work on this thing. But he... Um, he he got it mostly done like the main things like the pier and the roll off and windows and a bunch of other stuff and then we staged it up for testing which uh, I did in the winter and late early winter and then uh, spring um, just to see and then we we made a bit of a game plan for the uh, remaining things of which involve uh, uh, fixing up this pier which was the big engineering feat so that is done it's awesome it's perfect. And then uh, now it's the business of putting the power in as the next big project. And uh, we've had all this rain, which typically you're not hoping for with astronomy, but my hillside, if if it's not really wet, is the consistency of um, marble in places. Um, and fortunately, we've had so much rain here, uh, in particular here, not even as much has been falling in Regina, but here we've had tons and tons of rain and the hillside is totally saturated and we have more rain coming later in the week. So he's actually going to trench down 
And then as we get the rain later in the week, he's going to see how far down he can dig. Originally, we were only going to go eight or nine inches, but we're going to go as deep as he can get his pick in. And then we're going to lay a cable. And then he's going to put a couple, uh, what do you call them? Boxes to plug in one on the pier and one on the wall. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he'll be able to light the power up. So hopefully that happens within the next couple of weeks. And also he's going to put some shelving in for me. Then I'll have to paint. Then I'll have to paint the floor. And then uh, should be good to put the seven inch in. So however long that takes uh, will be how, however long it is before I get uh, a telescope back in there. Could be a month, could be mm. two. Well, before winter is still a good thing. So we'll um, see. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait anxiously for the next text update from you. <laughs> uh, for those following the game here, uh, we are into month... Uh, this is month 15 we're starting of a six-week telescope observatory build. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not a joke. That's true. But it's yeah. all good. Uh, yeah. The cost so far is the... We're, I think we've just uh, passed the cost of a um, sort of middle-of-the-road sky shed pod plastic observatory. So that's that's sort of the, the cost range that we're working with. So... Um, yeah, the, the cost is very affordable for a custom build observatory, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Hmm. So what, what do they say? There's like a saying, you can either have it quickly and expensive and well done or well cheap. done, less yeah. expensive. Cheap, and fast and quality. Yeah, it takes takes a long time. And I, I mean, I, I think going the, the slow route has been... Uh, has been the way to go because as we work through the problems, like it works beautifully. And I know people, even while I've been building this observatory that have run into total showstoppers with theirs um, and can't get their observer. I know one person who ended up building a, a really beautiful, expensive storage shed in a very inconvenient location. Um, actually, I know two people. And so uh, that's tough. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm sure we'll get them working eventually. It's just... There, there is a lot of engineering that goes into this, and uh, for sure, I would have made many mistakes if I didn't have uh, have employed an expert builder. So, yeah. Anyway, that's the story of the observatory. Let's get on to what people can see in the nighttime sky this month. We have a lot of really cool things. In fact, Shane, we have all these. Well, we have the opposition of Saturn, but then we have all these occultations. In fact, there's an occultation mm. of of Saturn as well. But uh, some pretty cool stuff. And even starting on September 1st, we have the uh, zodiacal light becomes visible um, in September. And for the next uh, few months, uh, you'll be able to see this uh, brightening in the eastern morning sky. And what it looks like is kind of like sort of a faint homogenous pyramidal glow that's coming up through the uh, zodiac. And if I'm recalling correctly, the science now states that... Uh, much of this material is uh, is material that's been blown off Mars by the uh, solar wind and is now in orbit um, throughout the inner solar system. Yeah, yeah, it's a neat thing to observe if you if uh, your skies allow it, um, and it's easy, right? You just need your eyes and uh, a bit of a dark sky. In fact, we've we've seen this not far outside of our city here, if I'm not mistaken, Chris. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, saw it from uh like 15 minutes out of the city so you don't it's something you don't need uh a pristine sky or anything like that in uh in order to see mm -hmm. yeah for sure i'm just looking up the next thing though because mercury is uh is that greatest elongation uh west in the morning sky on the fifth it's Dan and Leo, but Leo is starting to rise in the morning sky again, sort of uh, strangely enough. But this uh, its one of those things, I'm just seeing where the moon lies, lines up with it. Yeah, the moon and Mercury get pretty close on the first, actually. So if you get up really early on the first, you'll see Mercury is just uh, north of east. And then the moon is lying basically just halfway between east and northeast. Um, and basically, this is all just almost within 
the sickle of Leo, though you you might have trouble making out the sickle of Leo because it's just getting bright as these are in the sky, but definitely Mercury and the moon uh, will be visible and they're far enough away from the sun. And because of this time of year, the angle is such that it is still reasonably dark. So you'd be able to get Mercury and the moon in the same uh, field of view at the same time, which would be pretty cool to see, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be a great observation. Yeah, I'm just going to turn on my... Uh, my scope display here just to see if i can fit them both in yeah just barely but yeah and it's a very old moon so it's a very slender crescent in fact typically you know mercury is very difficult to see um but this time i think you'll have a fairly good shot of seeing mercury like i said just north of east and it's really going to be the brightest thing in the eastern sky it's going to be up not real high but when it's up about and say about three and a half or four degrees, uh, the moon is going to be about another two degrees uh, above and then about uh, four degrees uh, to the north of it. But you'll be able to put Mercury in the bottom right of your binocular field and the moon will appear in the top left. But I don't know that you'd see the moon naked eye. Uh, you definitely need binoculars, I think, to see it because it's literally hours or, you know, maybe a dozen or more hours away from being noon. Should be a pretty cool sight. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And then on the eight, or sorry, on the fifth, sorry, third is new moon. Mm -hmm. So on the first, that's when you can see it. So I guess it's about two days away from being new. Um, September third is the new moon, and then on the fifth, that's when Mercury is at uh, its greatest elongation in the morning sky, being eighteen degrees away from the sun, uh, which isn't. Um, like record setting, this is sort of like a pretty average distance for it to be away from the sun in uh, in a greatest elongation, uh, meaning that this is the best time to observe it because it's far enough away from the sun that it still appears in a semi-dark sky. And this is actually a fairly good one as uh, Mercury uh, elongations go. And then on September 8th, we have Saturn at opposition, Shane. That's always uh, like a great indicator um, for more planetary observing. Yeah. And this year, Saturn is, is coming along uh, to be towards uh, ring edge on, which is it next year? I think it's next year that the rings start to get yeah. uh, fairly edge on. Right now, they're uh, fairly close to edge on. You're going to have trouble seeing any detail on the rings, I think. Yeah, I think so too. They're, they're not quite 100% edge on, which is a neat observation. Um, but it does take away from some of the detail that you can see and, and really some of the beauty of Saturn. But I think you're right, Chris, next year is when it's edge on officially. And then it starts to open up every year after that. Yeah. And I think, uh, this enables you as, as the listener and us as well, Shane, to have sort of a, a replication of sorts of Galileo's early observations, because I think it was kind of sort of around this sort of opposition that uh, Galileo first spotted Saturn, and then he drew it with these ears, and then his uh, subsequent observations, I think, in, in the following year, um, he did not note any of the rings. And mm -hmm. of course, that's because uh, soon after he uh, first observed Saturn through his uh, his small telescope, it went edge on. And so he just chalked it up to some sort of erroneous observation um, and may not have gotten getting back to it. So it's uh, it's one of those things that uh, we can kind of witness for ourselves as we're approaching this uh, edge on period of time. Although as, as a ring lover of sorts, it's it's kind of nice to uh, to see those rings, but I'm excited for the uh, edge on experience. I think I missed it the last time. I think we just had a terrible run of bad weather. Yeah. Yeah. I did see it a few times last time, but um, I'm excited to see it again. One, I was just looking up the cycle. So one full cycle for Saturn lasts approximately 28 years 20 yeah one's like 27 3 and 27 mm. 8 it varies like you get one that's shorter okay. than one that's longer yeah interesting yeah very cool yeah and uh then also on uh on september 8th or thereabouts uh, mars is going to be very close to m35 and that will be in and around sort of like the after midnight hour. Of course, like Mars isn't moving uh, super quickly amongst mm -hmm. the stars. So uh, I think it's going to be within about a degree or so over over the course of a few uh, nights there in the uh, in the second week of September. Mm, that's cool. Another fun observation to add to the list. 
Yeah, it could be. I think I feel like that would be more like an astrophotography type thing. So I'm trying to put those mm. those things into the mix, although I'm not an astrophotographer, so I, I could be wrong here. Uh, September 9th, Mercury is going to get very close to Regulus in the morning sky, but I think this one's going to be pretty tough to see. I'm just popping ahead in my software here. And yeah, I mean, on the 9th, it's, it's getting a bit low. Um, you're going to have to be out right at about 5 a.m., whatever your local time is here. But man, uh, Regulus and Mercury do get within about like that uh, half degree mark of each other. So uh, that would be well worth being able to uh, take a shot at seeing, I think. Yeah, absolutely. What's the magnitude of both? It should be kind of oh, close. Oh, yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's, like they uh, almost it's... look twinsy. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it here, and you're going to hear all kinds of funky stuff from my computer when I try to do this. But it is coming up as I have so many different things turned on on my computer. Just bear with me. But it's bright. Uh, Mercury uh, is going to be brighter than Regulus at this time. Um, it's at negative 0.8, so pretty close to negative one, mm -hmm. whereas uh, Regulus is uh, magnitude 1.4. So these are pretty bright. And uh, what's what's neat about being able to see them close together, and uh, not only to be able to see them close together in the same low power eye piece of uh, whatever telescope you have, because pretty much just with any telescope, uh, even up to like 20 or so inches would be able to see them in the same low power eyepiece field. Um, and with definitely like with my five inch, I'll be able to run like a hundred power or something like that and still have them both in the same field is to be able to see that contrast in, uh, in brightness there. It'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely it would. So let's see on, um, uh, so that's on the ninth Mercury is very close to Regulus. And then on the 10th, uh, we missed this one. So I was, I was monkeying around a bit. Uh, so people should look this up if they're in Australia and Indonesia. I think that's the general area where there's an Antares occultation uh, by the moon. Oh, yeah, that would be really cool to see. Like, I bet the uh, kind of the redness of Antares would really pop beside, you know, the stark gray moon. Mm. And I think it's visible. There's a few places it's visible in Australia in that general region. Um I'm sure we have a listener in the, in the area. I was trying to figure it out, but, uh, uh, those, those folks that would be are pretty experienced observers anyway. So they'll be mm -hmm. able to sort it out. So I'm really just raising it, uh, to people's attention. So just run your software for your particular location. And, uh, much like Canada and North America, really Australia is so huge that, uh, it would be impossible for me to try to determine who it was visible for and who it wasn't because I mean, geez, on one side of uh, the Australian continent, it would be totally not visible. And then on, on another particular spot, it would be visible and yet again, go even further and uh, it's not going to be visible again. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people should definitely take a look because I think there is quite a wide swath where and the Antares occultation by the moon is going to be visible for Australia. Um, September 11th, we have the first quarter moon. And then on September 17th, um, this one, Shane, we might get it. Saturn is going to be occulted by the moon. Uh, from here, I ran it just barely visible about 5.30 a.m. And okay. ideally, you'd want to be um, west of sort of that Saskatchewan-Alberta border sort of running straight through North America. Uh, but if you are west of that line, I think you've got a fairly good shot at seeing it in the morning sky. It's low. I think it's up about five degrees or so for us even. Um, but once you once you get much further west uh, than, than the uh, sort of very central part of uh, North America, you have just a better and better chance of, of seeing it, especially like Edmonton should, uh, should have no trouble seeing this at all. Yeah, uh, the moon's doing a whole bunch of occulting in yeah. September. Right? Yeah. yeah, same on the West Coast. Like if you're on the very West Coast, um, that would be neat. Uh, because what you'll see is the moon passing in front of Saturn on September 17th, very early in the morning. Again, run your softwares. Uh, it looks like about 5.30 a.m. for us local time, but that could vary Um you know, it's going to, it's going to vary because if you're further West than us at sea, it's going to be like 4.30 a.m. or, or perhaps even earlier. And it's going to vary by the minute just because of your inclination to the moon and Saturn and that sort of thing. So you want to run that. Um, but it's really neat to be able to see those rings start to dip 
uh, behind the moon and then eventually the moon will swallow up saturn and uh, i guess if you're fur fur enough uh west you know you'll be able to to see the whole thing uh, pop out maybe from the you know uh the extreme west maybe like bill we would be able to uh to see the whole thing play out um yeah, he, he might struggle to see it reappear, but uh, at, at the very least, everybody that's uh, west of us should have a decent shot of seeing it uh, be swallowed up by the moon, which is, that's really like the cool part of seeing it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, September 18th, we have a partial lunar eclipse. This is sort of best visible from Brazil, and I ran it. I couldn't get it to appear for us here. Um and in really Eastern North America and Western Europe and Western Africa are probably your your best spots to to see it outside of Brazil. Uh, but man, it's it's really this this uh, this partial lunar eclipse is nothing to write home about. Probably not even worth getting up to see unless you're really into astrophotography or doing some sort of lunar something or other where you're a real uh, lunar person like I do know a few people um, because it barely just passes through the umbra. So it's just yeah. the moon's going to dim down a little bit and then it's going to get a small little bit of a shadow just on the limb of the moon. But everybody should go out and look at the moon very early on the 18th, especially around 1.15 a.m. Saskatchewan time or 3.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time because the moon occults Neptune for most of North America except the far southern reaches of the of the USA. But for most of North America, actually, the moon occults Neptune that night. Another one. Pretty neat. Yeah, that eclipse. <clears throat> if you didn't know it was happening, you probably would miss that pretty easily. Uh, yeah, for sure. The mm -hmm. eclipse is nothing to write home about i i've tried to see some of these extreme partial mostly penumbral eclipses before and yeah you can maybe commit yourself the moon is dimming down sometimes people have said they can definitely see it get it almost looks like it's slightly filtered or there's like a thin cloud passing in front of it i guess maybe if there was some other celestial event that was particular on that particular night uh, maybe you you could go for it because you're gonna maybe get another magnitude out of the stars or something but really uh, not worth looking for but the moon passing in front of neptune another occultation um yeah, pretty amazing to have a couple of these visible from at least somewhere like for those that are in uh, western uh, north america to be able to get a couple of these uh you know not quite on concurrent nights but but pretty close because saturn is on the 17th, uh, going to be early in the evening. And then, I mean, yeah, I mean, as the moon comes across the sky within the next, uh, you know, few hours, you're going to be able to see it a, a, a cult Neptune. I think if I've got this right, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. I'm just going to run, run my software here. Super quick. Sorry. It sounded like you had a comment anyway, so you go for it. No, no, I just, uh, no, nothing really to add. I think that, uh, what I like about this is that with um just centering the moon here here we go yeah so i'm just looking at this here now so yeah it's really in the morning on the 17th that it's occulting uh saturn so we just barely get it uh like i said around 5 30 in the morning and I really want to be watching it like around five from here i i think it's going to be a fairly uh tall order and then it is uh, like 1.30, uh, not quite one thirty in the morning. It's like quarter after one. And you want to be watching in quite a few minutes before that, that uh, Neptune gets occulted. So it's not quite 24 hours later. I guess it's like, what, 20, 21 hours later, something like that. Um, you, you can see basically within 24 hours, two planets being occulted by the moon. I don't know. I, I've been doing this a long time with these days and times and occultations and everything. I don't know that we've had um, two planet occultations occur within a 24-hour period before. I think this is an extremely rare event. Um, yeah, I can't think of another time that that's happened. Uh, admittedly, occultations are not high, <clears throat> high on my list, but mm. yeah, I don't recall it, Chris. And why they're high on my list is that this is because of the the nature of the color of the moon, like the sort of uh, mm. bright white or you know super illuminated gray tones. It it causes anything that is nearby 
to uh, almost like super saturate in whatever colors it is. So Neptune right. can kind of have sort of an aquamarine color, which is actually, to my eye, fairly difficult to see in a small telescope. But but as it's as Neptune's getting occulted by the moon, I really expect to see that color pop. So I I do intend to try to take a peek at this uh, set of events here. And the same with Saturn. Sometimes Saturn can appeal uh, appear sort of. Uh, like a bit of a washed out kind of uh, yellowy orange type thing. Um, but it's sort of pale in comparison, but uh, right, right beside the moon, uh, we should be able to get a good view of it. Mm -hmm. On the uh, 21st, that's when Neptune is, is at opposition. Uh, just finding Neptune is usually the challenge. It's, it's, uh, it's going to require some significant aperture and uh, some observing skill to, to tease out uh, too much detail, but you should be able to see maybe uh, one of the largest moons there, which I think is Triton, mm -hmm. um, if you have a have a good sized telescope. On uh, September twenty second, that is the uh, autumnal equinox. Okay, which you there we can't go. really see, but <laughs> I mean, maybe it'll be colder. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, that night, though, the moon is going to be 0.2 degrees away from the Pleiades. So M45 and the moon are going to be basically together in the sky again. Uh, that's kind of a neat thing to see through binoculars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, whenever you get those close pairings, always nice to look at. And then uh, last quarter moon is September 25th. Okay. We should probably talk a little bit about comets as well. Yeah. So we've talked in the past about uh, A th or C twenty twenty three A three uh, Su uh, Su Atlas yeah. uh, could get to magnitude two is the forecast uh, by mm. the end of September in the morning sky, and it kind of stalled out in terms of brightening in like June July. Yeah, but looking at the the curve right now, recent observations have it at magnitude eight, and now it's like. It's following that prediction or forecast yeah. brightening curve. So yeah. we'll have to keep an eye on it. Yeah. I'm just looking at it here. Uh, where is it now? It's I'm looking for, it's just, it kind of does this weird loop to loop. I found August. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of no not land really, a little bit. Yeah. It's sort of like over in Virgo right now. So it's, it's going to be sort of in the very Southwestern, uh, sky for us, I think it'd be pretty tough to see. So yeah. it's when it, it, it's when it loops back into our sky that, uh, that's when we're starting to have a, have a decent look at it. I think. Well, September, isn't it kind of in Hercules and like beside of Hercules and above Ophucus? I'm just trying to get it. What's the, is it, uh, four, seven, eight P is that it? No. I don't okay. think okay. so. What is it? What's the number? C twenty twenty three A three. Oh, okay, so it's the it's a long period. C. Let me just see if I've got it in my. There's a few common atlas E's. Let's see. Oh yeah, here I got it. Just a sec. It's going crazy. And when is it above the horizon? Do we get it in a dark sky? No, man. It sets. It sets just as it's as it's getting uh, bright in the morning. It is. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at September seventeenth. Yeah, it's like way below Mercury. So unless it gets okay. and coming in at magnitude six. So, but just let me pop ahead a number of days and see where this goes, because it does come up into the morning sky as we get into October, and then it starts to come down again. Fourth magnitude. Oh, it's too bad. It must get up into the evening sky, though, hey? Eventually. That's yeah. Where, yeah um, there we it's go. looking like October, it starts to become an evening object as well as yeah. a morning object. Yeah. I think that uh, that this is, yeah, but I think it starts to fade out. Um, looks like it's going to hit about fifth magnitude. But then, you know, it's going to be up into Serpent's and that area. I'm going to say that once it gets sort of into that line between Arcturus and Antares, which it enters into in the second week of October, I think that's going to be the golden time. It's going to be around like in the fourth magnitude, 
that's pretty bright. That's a naked eye comet chain. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Binocular yeah. comet. Looks like forecasted tail maybe even be like 10 degrees. Holy smokes. Yeah, it could so, be one of those, you know, once in a generation comets if all of this happens. Yeah, it's definitely maybe not once in a generation. I'm going to say once in six years, five years. What was, we had that one in, what was it, 2020? Something it's like not, that, yeah. yeah. It's not, what was that one? Oof, it's and, escaping me. Yeah, anyway, that it's not going to be as good as that one, uh, but it will probably be the best well-placed, brightest comet since 2020. And uh, yeah, definitely you can go uh, half a dozen or so years before you get another comet that's brighter than fifth magnitude. Because that's really, to me, you can get a sixth magnitude comet. That means you can see it unaided eye or pretty easy in binoculars. Um, but really, not until it gets into the fourth magnitude, just because of the fuzzy nature of it, does it uh, really uh, become a, a naked eye comet to, uh, to the unaided eye. What was the name of that uh, of that comet? Now it's uh, really bugging me. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, I can't recall it. Um, Neowise, that was that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, and that one there. I mean, I could I, like I remember when people like somebody wrote me about it. I got up and it was clear the next morning, and the street lights were out behind my house, and I walked out, and I could. Then it was like seven degrees up or something, and I was like, oh. I'm just coming out in my backyard just in the off chance. And I saw it like mm -hmm. through binoculars, no problem. Like, you know, literally looking down the street between streetlights that were a couple blocks away, I could see the comet. I was like, oh, that's going to be bright. And then I think, uh, uh, you know, I started going out into the dark sky uh, to, to take peeks at it. But yeah, it was, uh, that was pretty good. July 3rd, uh, just around the time when our, petrol twilight was ending yeah that was pretty cool to see yeah that was a great comment yeah let's see what else any deep sky objects or double stars or anything on your uh, radar for uh the month of september um i'd have to check my rask double star list there's i think i might have one or two fall ones to observe although i think i've got them all it'll mostly be checking off a few of the summer ones and maybe staying up really late kind of going into the fall to get some of the winter constellations because there's a couple winter doubles that i need to get as well but uh, yeah i don't have the number the designations offhand so i can't really comment more than that yeah yeah i mean um i'm planning to just be out here as much as i can and uh you know hopefully finish up this observatory I'm going to take a couple days off in september to uh to do that painting in like two or three weeks time and uh, get in there and and finish painting it up and do the floor and then uh, should be able to put the big scope in and uh, get rocking and rolling of course you know i didn't tell you this but to haul the scope out here so i didn't bring it out because uh you know we we're going away and wasn't going to be around a lot and uh plus we are getting we do get other work done on our on our cabin from time to time and i just didn't want it being around the dust and there's also not that much room in the cabin it's only 550 square feet this is a tiny place so putting a, a telescope that's the size of a chesterfield uh in this place is is maybe more than my wife would like mm -hmm. um so I've been keeping it at home and in, in a good spot. And, uh, and then of course, uh, suddenly they've decided to tear the road up between here and home, um, oh. seven, 17 kilometers of it. And it's in, uh, excruciatingly bad shape. I would be reluctant to, uh, to bring a, a, a refractor along. There's uh, yeah, some bad spots, but they were flattening it out. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what it's like over over the next week or so, uh, what, what that road is like, but, uh, yeah, it was, it wasn't in the best of, uh, of condition, sadly. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Anything else to add to the show? No, that's, that's everything. Yeah. Please subscribe, share the show with other stargazers. You know, send us your show ideas, observations, and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>